the need for a real change in our attitude towards managing nature, which, God help us, we haven't done very well. And I think Ash Dyback gives us a chance to show that we can take another attitude. Um, the disease is here. There's absolutely no way of stopping it um, that we know, that we are capable of. We have no idea how um, devastating it's going to be. Um, it would help sometimes when we begin things like this to know a few of the facts. And the figure that um, in the catastrophizing process the BBC and the press put about that ash constitutes 30% of uh, Britain's, of England's tree cover is preposterous. The Forestry Commission's um, last census of trees and woodland in Britain, which is not many years ago, showed that ash is just about 5%. So the figure has been quoted times six in order to hype this crisis up. It will be a crisis, um, but not all the ash is going to die. In, po in Poland and Lithuania, which is where um, possibly this extraordinary organism, and it is, you know, if it wasn't about to do the damage that it does, it, uh, it is an incredibly fascinating organism. It's a, a fungus which has mutated into a completely new species, unknown on the planet hitherto, um, whose great weakness may be that it uh, reproduces asexually. So all the spoilings that come from it are completely identical. This may mean that it becomes preyed on by viruses and bacteria. Um, and what is going to happen? I, well, uh, as I say, in Poland and Lithuania, there may be 10% of ash trees of shown resistance. In Denmark, it's 5%. Um, in this country, we don't know. We have a genetically very wide ash population. Um, the uh, ashes tend to look similar in a way that oaks don't, but they are genetically very, very varied. And for instance, the ones that live on um, very rugged limestone are completely different from those that live in deep loams. And if you transplant one from one site, put it in the other, it won't survive. So there is a great diversity, and it's that that will determine the future of the ash, not that anything that we do. Ash is much cleverer. It's been evolving for millions of years, and it has within it that variety that will prove resistant to the disease. And if we're clever, we may be able to tag along the tree's own cleverness and begin to select um, seed from the resistant ashes and plant them out. But we need to go to be very careful when we do this, because if one of the collateral lessons of this uh, crisis um, is the folly that we have all shown in the conservation movement in relying on planting trees as a way of reviving woodland. Um, and planting them from really uh, un uncontrolled nursery stocks where you don't know where they're coming from, where they're very often from a very narrow genetic range and are in fact battery saplings. Mm -hmm. And so no wonder they are prone to disease. The thing which we will need to do um, in a response to ash dieback is to give the ash population um, a chance to show its own resistance and then learn from that. It is also to stop the wholesale kind of wanton planting of trees um, and allowing natural regeneration which is itself a selective process, selecting for vigour and suitability for site, to take precedence over tree planting wherever it is appropriate, which is in a very large number of sites. I'm putting in mind of uh, the fact that we've been celebrating, if that's the right word, the 25th anniversary of the Great Storm. Um, you know, for those of us who lived in Edinburgh for a while, there have been great storms before this one, but of course, the great storm hit London and the journalists, so they noticed it more, didn't they? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but we learnt an awful lot from the great storm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, the storm was the most important <laughs> event in nature conservation um, since the war. Um, it taught those who were prepared to listen, and fortunately most people were, especially the National Trust, um, that catastrophic events are entirely natural in landscape, and especially in woodlands, 
that woodlands are programmed to recover from them tremendously well, sometimes by swapping species about. And it showed that uh, in almost every case where humans had intervened to clear up what they regarded as being rubbish, um, they produced and scraping the top forest soil away in the process, they created conditions where it was very difficult for any trees to survive. In places where that wasn't practiced, very often because there was no money to do it, thank God, and the wreckage was simply left there, you go back now, 25 years later, and you think, where the hell was the storm? Because it's now a perfectly self-willed natural woodland, um, perfectly fitted to the site um, in terms of its uh, species composition and its uh, density of trees. Um, and what was happening, of course, is, is uh, the, the forest natural renewal mechanism that underneath the, uh, all the fallen uh, foliage and the great rotting trunks, seeds were regenerating and being sheltered from grazing animals and um, from uh, temperature uh, extremes by this canopy of debris. And this is precisely what happens in truly natural woodlands where human beings have not intervened and stop these perfectly good things happening. Um, so the lesson from the storm um, was, uh, you know, leave well alone unless you have to take action for, um, for any kind of, of health and safety reasons or, or anything else. Like in Bloomsbury Square. Mm. Yeah. Like in Bloomsbury Square, <laughs> I remember seeing it all happen before our very eyes and with children clambering in the tops of trees. Um, who would never experience that again. That was in itself a wonderful um, but horrible experience.